You're listening to Film Seizure. Before we get started, just a word of caution. This is a pretty R-rated show, so if you're listening at work or school or around your kids or grandparents or, hell, church for that matter, you might want to put some headphones on. Catch new episodes every other Wednesday on FilmSeizure.com and follow us on Facebook at Film Seizure and Twitter and Instagram at Film Seizure, all one word. But for now, if you're all set, then let's sit back and enjoy a couple of grade A assholes, sit around and talk about movies. This is the terrifying adventure that could set the world on fire. Warlock. Hello and welcome to Film Seizure. I'm Jeff Arbuckle. I'm Jason Oliver. And uh, we are going to talk about the 1989-ish, 1991 for sure. Yeah. Um, supernatural thriller. Yeah. Titular Warlock. adventure. Yeah. Scare fest warlock. Some of those words don't match nope. what we saw. Not at all. But that's okay. I'm trying to hype it up. <laughs> I'm trying to hype it up. Yeah. See, I'm trying to I'm trying to put everyone in the same mood I was in before I watched this movie. Because, yeah. Well, so, what what is your connection to World? You kind of have maybe a little richer connection to this movie. I actually had a little bit of a <laughs> misunderstanding of what we were going to watch, but, <laughs> but we'll get to we'll get to that here in a minute. Okay, um, okay. So, what? Tell me a little bit about what what, what was your um what what a, what stands out for you when you think of the movie Warlock okay. starring. Julian Sands and not quite Hugh Grant, Richard E. Grant. Yes, and don't forget our um, our femme fatale, <laughs> oh, Laurie Singer. Man. Yeah. Okay, we'll talk about her. Uh, all right, my connection <laughs> to this movie. So, um, so real quickly too, uh, we're watching all three Warlock movies in a row. So we just finished Warlock one. As soon as we wrap up this, we're going to be watching Warlock two. So we're watching them all. We're not quite sure what this is going to do to us, but. Um, <laughs> Uh, we were hoping to really Nothing start good, on a high, um, and I think that that high has been tempered. Um, so we'll talk about the movie here in a moment. But yeah, connection. Why do we choose? Or why do we choose Warlock? Um, I mean, quite honestly, I saw that there was a, a, a re- re- reissue of the, the trilogy on Blu-ray. I was like, that would be funny. We should watch those movies. Um, three movies, tight packed trilogy, pretty easy to to consume. Um, let's let's start there. Uh, but yeah, I definitely had a, a nostalgic connection to the first movie as a kid. Um, so I didn't see a lot of movies in the theaters, at least mo- not movies like this when I was growing up. Um, I would never in a million years have been allowed to see this movie when I was 10 or when I guess it would have been more like 12 when by the time it was finally released in theaters. No way. I would have been, I would have had to sneak to see it. Um, but uh, what I did see was I, I, I watched a lot of cable. Um, I know Jeff, you watched a lot of cable. Yeah, yeah, um, I did. And even what I watched on cable was was moderated to some degree. But I would, you know, you're a kid, you find ways to watch as much television as you want, no matter what. If it's available in your house and the channels are there, you're gonna you're gonna see them. So uh, I was a big proponent of staying up really late um, after my parents went to bed and watched like USA up all night, Saturday Nightmares. You know, those were kind of Jim Bob Briggs, you know, or is it Joe, Bob. Joe Bob Briggs. Yes, yeah. thank you. Um, you know, I, I really grew up on that sort of yeah. USA diet of of B-horror um, and, and just B-films in general. But uh, uh, so but this one in particular, I have this strange kind of nostalgic connection to it from um, – my dad uh, still is, but was very involved when I was a kid in the um, Catholic men's organization, the Knights of Columbus. Oh, nice. Right? Nice, nice. So um, Knights of Columbus, if you're not familiar, they're, they're sort of a, a, frater- a men's fraternity within the Catholic Church. Think like the Masons, but for Catholics. Uh, and what they do is um, they kind of do community service in the in the uh, community and all of that. They try and give back. They do hunger drives and, and food drives and all that stuff. But they also... Um, very much drink <laughs> on the weekends. They they usually Fridays nights specifically after the work week they get together at their club and they usually have a bar. It's like a private club and a bar and they drink um, beer and whatever. And they usually have, they have a pool table. Like my my dad's particular chapter had a pool table 
and uh, Friday night, so you could usually bring your kids. So <laughs> I used to love to go because I'd meet, I'd, I'd see all these kids that I would see every every Friday night that I wouldn't necessarily see in school, um, and uh, we could we pretty much just let to do whatever what the hell we wanted, right? Like the guys, the our dads would just be drinking at the bar, and we would watch TV in the lounge. And the lounge, you know, wasn't really moderated. We watched whatever the hell we want. And I would usually watch whatever crappy television was on cable. And that's where I saw this movie. Uh, I remember watching this with a couple of other kids um, at the Knights of Columbus Lounge of all places, watching this movie. And it's just like with these very heavy satanic overtones, right? Um, and thinking, <laughs> man, this is super creepy. I'm like, I don't know, 12 years old, probably 13 years old, maybe. Uh, and really getting into it. Um, and I remember some scenes very specifically that we'll talk about when we get into the movie. But yeah, I kind of had like a, oh man, I'm watching something I shouldn't be watching. You know, wow, my dad's in the next room drinking beers with his buddies. It just kind of has like this warm blanket feel for me. Um, it's a very, very specific short burst of nostalgia. Mm, but yeah. it's still kind of, that's what I remember when I think <laughs> about this movie. And now that I watched it probably for the first time in two decades or more, um, I don't know if I'm going to be able to retain that kind of nostalgia, <laughs> but, um, but yeah, that's kind of like, yeah, yeah, let's watch that. I remember liking it as a kid. Um, so and I think that some of these movies are probably, it's going to be a common occurrence. Yeah, yeah, I think so. I mean, you know, I mean, that's one thing we're going to, we're going to watch a lot of movies that we grew up on. Um, every now and then we might do something a little bit more classic yeah. or we might do something a little bit more uh, contemporary but for the most part, we're talking about stuff that we either watched, always wanted to watch, or um, you know, stuff that was around when we were coming of age. Yeah. You know, and I think that you know, as far as my connection to this movie, I remember. I mean, that white box of Julian Sands standing there with like his little with his fingertips together. And then his shadow creating like that demony thing. Oh, over the sand. Uh, well, it was, was over just. It was one? just a white. It was just a white box. Okay. I, I. It probably is. That might be the second one, actually. Yeah, I think it's the first is one. Because I remember the, the. Sorry to interrupt. The the cover to the first one always had him in the, like the black. With yes, the white background, but it, yeah. but it had like the shadow, right? Yeah. Is that what you're yeah. talking about? Yeah. 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 Okay. Yeah. All right. Then yeah. So we're, we're probably the yeah. So you know I. Had, you know, I'd always seen that in, in the in the video store. I cannot help but to think that it was one of those movies where you know I always had sleepovers with one of my friends, usually on I think Saturday nights, and uh, we watched a lot of the movies that we're going to talk about here, um, be it comedies or or horror or sci-fi, typically. Um, the, so I'm sure we, we either rented it. I know we rented it once because I remember there's a scene that takes place. Um, I remember a lot of the end scene in the graveyard and a lot of the scene that, that takes place on the farm. Mm -hmm. And, um, I mean, I, there were things as we were watching that, I was like, yeah, I, yeah, yeah I remember those. Um, and, and certainly, I remember the aesthetic of Julian Sands mm -hmm. um, and, and his ponytail and his black suit and his, you know, his menace yeah. technically. But um, honestly, uh, I probably only saw this movie once. I mean, I, there were other things that were demon me that I got more into when I was a teenager, like night of the demons yeah. where it was really more of a straight up monster horror movie. Right. Yeah. Um, but the, these types of movies, you know, uh, I mean, it was one of those things that we'd eventually would have re would have rented. Now, <laughs> a little bit of a, of a misconnect when you first said, I want to do Warlock. And I'm thinking, ooh, they're like, first of all, there are like 14 of these movies that I'm thinking of. <laughs> and I'm thinking, so we're just going to basically start, come, on, come out hot with some with some uh, softcore porn. Oh, oh. I'm thinking of witchcraft. Right. Um, well, well, yeah, because <laughs> I was thinking too, that as we sort of watched this one, like, oh man, you know, this, these are sort of like the, the non-pornographic witchcraft movies, basically. 
Yeah, yeah, because they're very similar. There's a, there's a guy who's some there's sort there's of witch servant. board too. There's like, like a yeah, lot of witch board. Witch, series. witch board. Was, speaking of Night of the Demons, is made by the same. Okay. So Witch House and Witch Board, both made by uh, Kevin Tenney, or Tenney, 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 I think. Um, he made later a Night of the Demons. Um, so Witch Board, yeah, Witch Board, Witchcraft, Witchcraft was the. Um, Showtime slash Skinamax. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, kind of scary, but whatever we can do to get a playmate to bare breasts. Yeah. Um, and yeah, I saw a lot of those. Um, but, you know, so I thought that's what we were going to I was like, <laughs> wow, okay, well, Ooh, let's, that's... let's go. You know, let's do this. Um, no, then I then I was like, oh, wait, yeah, Warlock. That's the Julian Sands one. Because yeah, I yeah. always confuse Witchcraft and Warlock. Um yeah, but uh, they're like 14 witchcraft movies or whatever. They just kept pumping those things out. Oh, yeah. Um, but anyway, they so... They had their own section in the video store eventually. Yeah, yeah. they did. The special interest section. Yeah. <laughs> um, so anyway, uh, so no, at first that's what I thought we were watching. And it's like, oh, no, this is this is the for real, like, legit movie thriller. And so, um, yeah, I mean, like, I yeah. definitely remember seeing it. And I definitely remember... The image of that of that video store shelf with the white box mm -hmm. and the, yeah. you know, but um, I don't have quite the same um, the the very specific movie that I probably just kind of as an aside. You talk about those very specific moments of yeah uh, of uh, nostalgia. I think Waxwork was mine oh, that yeah. I first saw okay. on Saturday Nightmares or something, and then. Uh, you know, saw the uncut version from the video store or something. You know? Sure, yeah. Uh, but anyway, well, so it's funny you mentioned that the uncut version because I was watching this movie, Warlock, and thinking, you know, I don't know if I've ever seen the uncut version. I think I've probably only seen the cable version. I'm trying to like watch this movie and determine what did I miss. But mm -hmm. we were both kind of discussing how it's a rated R movie, but it didn't really feel rated R. Um, right. There's no nudity. There's yeah. no. I mean, there's, there's really, a little bit of blood, but not that, yeah, not, not much that strong much. language. Um, I, don't, I don't think there was, there was any. one buck in the whole movie. I don't think there was. I don't think there was any. Um, I think maybe, and I don't know. You might have your own theory on this, but I feel like anything dealing with Satan in the late '90s or, or late '80s, I'm sorry, early '90s, I think probably got scrutinized yeah. a little, a little more than your average fare. Um, yeah the whole just there was a lot of hysteria around those types of themes um yeah i mean we've certainly talked about this before just in general about how um the church groups or uh things that that we would know these days as like one million moms or whatever yeah, you know yeah. there were a ton of groups like that even more so back then uh special interest groups that were very very strin stringent on what was acceptable for younger people mm -hmm. and um yeah so i mean that's that's kind of interesting because this is not i mean this is even lighter than some movies that i've seen that dealt with satan and witchcraft and and uh devilry and demons and stuff like that that came out in the sixties or the yeah. early seventies. Oh, yeah, I mean, it's even lighter than some of those. And, uh, and I mean, and some of those movies, I mean, some of the hammer movies in particular really ramped yeah. up a lot of like sexuality or something, you just know, the, the, the symbolism and the, 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 yeah, just the, they really pushed that whole visual aspect of, yeah. of the occult, you yeah. know, in those movies. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, and I think that, yeah, I think you're right. I think it's just, Oh, there is uh, witchcraft, or there's some sense of demonism, or whatever. Instant are just to just to protect themselves. Which, I mean, if if you're getting that much heat from groups that are, you know, that that would have cared especially about the, the proliferation of satanic symbolism and things like that then i kind of get i i kind of side with the with the ratings board on that on that topic of just just make it r and just sure you know just you know whatever leave it to the to the video stores and to the movie theaters to police who gets their hands on it um but anyway so um let's uh 
let, let's kind of dig into the movie. The the it, this is this is a very interesting mix of a lot of things that are very um that that were that were very well known yeah. by the time this movie Most came out in early ninety one. Um, first of all, as we kind of we talked about it while we watched the movie, the movie was made uh, probably sometime in the spring of eighty eight or summer of yeah. eighty eight. It 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 was delayed. it was delayed probably because New World was going under. Yeah. Um, it cost New World a ton of money, which probably yeah thirty million thirty million dollars I think was the budget right fifteen 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 okay it was not that bad. but uh, so it eventually did get out there because of um, Trimark, right? Yeah. So it, yeah. it did eventually get out there, but probably after catalogs were purchased and, yeah. and movies shifted hands. But it was, I mean, it was done and it very much looks and feels like a late 80s movie, but was released in the 90s. Yeah. Um, and I think that that's kind of important to think about as we think about not only who made the movie, what the movie was about, um, the way people looked and the way people acted. Um, I think those are all things that we're probably going to touch on when we talk about this movie. <laughs> but um, so let's, uh, let, let's, uh, why don't you uh, hit us up with, uh, with, with what, what goes on in Warlock? Oh well, yeah. So um, Warlock opens in, what is it? The, is it supposed to be the 17th century, 16th century? Yeah. So it says like, I think they said something like 1691, yeah, so which 17th century, New England. Surprise, shocker, right? Yeah. Um, and uh, yeah, there's this big hullabaloo. All the the town officials are gathering, getting together, and on a tizzy, and they go into this this basically this prison castle. And in this room is our is our protagonist or our antagonist. Sorry, uh, <laughs> but the protagonist is there too, or is hanging out. He hangs with out. Him. Yeah, he hangs out with them, and uh, he, it's Julian Sands. Um, he's got the, the long blonde hair and the ponytail all dressed in black and he's he's got his hands tied to his ankles yeah in this prison chamber and um in actuality it was a weird kind of cuff system where it was like basically fingers were cuffed to toes yeah so like you literally could not run away without basically tearing a digit off of your hand. I guess you could you could like somersault if you're really if you were really good at that you could just seems like it would all just hurt really bad (laughs) yeah but uh, but yeah, he's in there, and uh, and basically he's a witch. They know he's a witch. They're um, he's been terrorizing the town in some way, and they're he's going to be executed. They're they're very vague yeah, on they're exactly really, what he's doing. I mean, go into the, it. The, I think it all deals with that book. Like he was already trying to assemble that dark Bible. Yeah, he's already got some relationship with that demon that yeah. he, that he talks to later. Um, so yeah, he's he's definitely a bad dude, but um, but really, yeah, you don't get a, a really good sense of how powerful he is or how evil he is, which I think honestly <laughs> is kind of an early problem with the movie. Um, is you yeah, don't, you we, don't get a real sense of his villainy. You think, I think maybe this is also a product of the time. You know, a movie like that in the late eighties, you're like early nineties, you're like yeah, he's a bad dude. He he's a He's with the devil, right? Nowadays, it's, there's a lot more, I think, like allegory in stories like that, and and we have yeah. a better understanding, I think, of, of a witch hunt and what was actually happening in Salem. It wasn't as it's not as sensationalized typically when you see a story like that presented. So, so seeing it, it's kind of like it's sort of trite. It's kind of like, oh yeah, they're setting him up. He's supposed to be this super evil witch. Um, he's going to be burnt at the stake. We know a lot more about <laughs> yes. how they're going to deal with him than we actually really know about him at this point. Yes, so, it's, they're very specific about the the mode of execution here. Yeah, I would love to see an actual diagram. Yes. I want the diagram actually on a shirt. Yes, because they what they say they're going to do is they're going to hang him, mm-hmm. and then they're going to burn him. Yes. But how are they going to burn? They're him? going to burn him over a basket of living cats not dead cats <laughs> living cats they're gonna burn them over the basket this of living seems cats. this is really this week where we just couldn't understand what the hell's going on with that i mean we did a little research on the fly and we found out that cat burning was a thing in the um 17th century it originated in france it appears 
the cat burning was um, was sort of a, a entertainment for people, which is totally twisted, but also an exorcism of the devil, basically. Like cats represented um, Satan, and they would burn them in wicker baskets. Uh, wow. Yeah. Yeah, that's rough. I mean, and I I think I maybe understand why they might have thought that was an overtaking of uh, of Satanism because like cats um reproduce a, a little bit more uh probably a little bit more than dogs even do like dogs probably even by the 1600s you mean like were, procreate right they re- like, reproduce right okay. so they probably um so probably what happened was was whenever a town and the french uh, you know non soap using froggies <laughs> were <laughs> <laughs> when they were uh basically probably when they thought that their town they all of a sudden see a ton of cats because cats went in the heat female cats were getting laid by every male cat and they were probably like all of a sudden producing litters of six or you know five or six cats at once and they probably thought it's some sort of a um uh, probably some sort of uh, of a blight you know or some sort of a um Curse. So it's kind of like an early um, Bob Barker esque uh, control the pet population. No tactic. N- n- no, no, no. no. <laughs> I think they actually meant to kill cats. Um, but but I mean, but, cats, but no, I mean, cats they, then they keep rodents away too, though. Like they had a they actually had a specific well, purpose. I, yeah, the, the I had kind of mentioned this when we had done our research that Western civilization looks at, at cats more negatively than Eastern civilizations. Okay. So my guess is when something started to run rampant that was not as friendly as a dog, they probably saw it as some sort of a curse. And so we're just going to round them all up and get rid of them. And, oh, by the way, we're dumb as fuck because we're all going to die of the plague because we didn't have the cats to stop the mice. Um, yeah. You know, I mean, my guess is is that the 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 different... Uh, man, this is just this is just this is all just spitballing. I'm spit just spitballing this. Um, my guess is is that because Western civilization thinks of cats slightly differently than they do dogs, um, that that that's probably why the plague ran rampant was because there was nothing to control the rats control because dogs rats. don't do that, uh, not the <clears> same way. Um, so uh, that's just spitballing, but. Um, but that kind of lines up with what I was telling you about how Eastern civilizations revere cats and Western civilizations yeah. revere dogs. Well, even today, I mean, I'm probably not too far off there because even today, um, it's really difficult for pet shelters to adopt out black cats. Yeah. Because there's a stigma around black cats and they're unlucky, they're somehow evil. Um, yeah. So, I mean, yeah. Probably, and the earth is flat too. Yes. So, yes. I mean, what, what, about, <laughs> what about the curve? Uh, anyway, so. Uh, so yeah, so but so but that that all right. We did a little research, and we found about cat burning, and um, but it still didn't make any sense because they're gonna burn him over a basket of living cats. Uh-huh. So what does that? How does that work? Is he gonna burn, and then he's gonna fall, and then he's gonna burn the cats with him? No, or, I think or the cats burning at the same time he's burning. No, I think they're gonna tie him after they hang him because yeah. he's already dead. Then they're going to burn them with cats. They're going to, yeah. So what they're going to do is they're going to tie them to a post. And you, you've seen the old movies where they burn in the witch and they have the, the planks or the, or the sticks that are used as like the kindling. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And they're tied to they the big post. Right. There. My guess is to put them on top of. Them. Yeah, my guess is instead of having those sticks, more commonly they, or at least in Europe, had baskets of cats, and they would just light the cats, and then it would light the body. This anyway. is why we need a diagram. So if anyone out there is listening <laughs> and they want to draw us a diagram, yeah, you can I mean, you can email your your uh, drawing to uh, filmseizure at gmail.com. Yeah, that would be great. Um, we will. I mean, or you can send it to us on Facebook. I mean, that's that's fine too. Um, I and um, we'll give you a three percent cut of t-shirt sales. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes, we will. Yeah, we're driving a hard bargain here. Hard bargain. So, okay, so what, what, okay. <laughs> so, <laughs> so the movie, after we get kind of hung up on, I get hung up on other things in the movie. We definitely both together got hung up on the cat The cat thing is, is, I can't even stop thinking about it. So right. I'm sorry. Um, 
Because yeah. because here's the thing here. All right, so <laughs> so I'm going to jump right in and talk about um, the the witch's escape because he's a witch. He's referred to through the the whole movie as a witch. Never once do they mention the word warlock in this movie. They do list him in the cast though as, as warlock. The warlock. Yes, yeah. there is, is even a discussion about can men be witches. Yeah, and the answer is yes by Julian Sands, who plays the warlock, <laughs> and it does not mention anything about warlock being a word for male witch. Yeah, he doesn't even do like the, well, actually, I'm a yeah, yeah. which yeah. I'm kind of grateful for. I was really lame, yeah. but still weird, right? Um, but anyway, so <laughs> at this point in time, you see Julian Sands. He's dressed in black. He's been labeled a witch. He's going to get executed over, uh, and burned over a basket of living cats um and he escapes this like this cyclone appears in his cell and our um our kyle reese terminator good guy bursts in in his his fur coat and he sees that he's about to escape and by i should also mention that he is doing the classic like beat him up while he's chained up before this in, in a brief scene before this but he bursts in julian sands is is being swept up in this cyclone um what is his, his name? Redfern? Redfern. Redfern. Yeah. He jumps into the cyclone and they disappear um, together. So at this point, I kind of thought, well, shit, man. I mean, he just probably saved those cats. Right? <laughs> yeah. I there, mean, there, he, there are basketfuls of cats. There's a basketful of cats who are like, shit, yeah, there's not going to be an execution today. Yeah. I'm super, I'm going to live. Yeah. At least until the next witch, right? Which so, will probably be the next day. So at this point in the movie, Julian Sands, to me, is a good guy. He's a good guy. He <laughs> saved he saved the cats. Now he quickly starts to go south from here. Um, but Jeff, tell us what happens. Um, so <laughs> after the cyclone uh, sweeps up our two um, our, hero, our, our and hero villain. And villain. Yeah. Okay. So, so we're not sure which is hero and villain yet, really. But we we what do, we we do, do know, but we don't but, because one guy was willing to burn a basket full of cats. Right. You know, yeah. Yeah. So, so okay, so we we now see okay, so this is happening in Salem, Boston, that area in the 1600s. Cut to present day, <laughs> present day like 1990 or whatever, uh, L.A., which is by the way for those of you who might be listening or you just don't know your you you're not you're not from the United States <laughs> or you don't know your geography at all. There's not too many cities that are further apart than Boston and L.A. Um, so it doesn't this is get weird. that much farther apart. No, the and, States, I mean, no. I guess you could say, well, you know, like the rotation of the earth, whatever. <laughs> so um, our heroine, played by um, Lori Singer, who is from Footloose and from the TV show Fame, and uh, yeah. is an Emmy Award winner, I saw, I think, or really? nominated at least. Um, for, for, for fame or for something no, else? No, 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 no. Something more recent, actually. Oh, that's interesting. Um, so anyway, so she's got this crazy-ass red hair that looks like Daryl Hannah's hair from Blade Runner, which is very mushroom-shaped, very perfectly mushroom-shaped. It's a wig. It's got to mm-hmm. be a wig. That cannot be her real hair. Mm-hmm. Um, she is sleeping in her bed. She hears a crash. And so she goes out into the living room, and there's Julian Sands in the living room. Like, yeah. he, he came in through the, through, the, um, uh, through the window. And so her roommate, who's a gay guy, they, they make a point to say that he's, or at least... At least a little later they do. They do, yeah. but they imply that he's gay just by the way he talks and what you know, he talks about. I, I didn't but it wasn't that it, as much. I didn't think it's it was, like, super stereotypical. stereotypical. No, really. yeah, which, he was just a little fake. Yeah. Which is not... Not a negative. For, for the late eighties, early nineties, I honestly, I honestly did not definitively think, oh, it, it was a gay character until after he was dead. Yeah. Even in the scene, his death scene, which we're coming up soon. Yeah. But um, I was like, oh, he's probably gay, but it still could have gone either way. Yeah, he could have just been uh, feminine. Yeah, which I thought, I thought was pretty good. Yeah, and yeah. So, so Julian Sands has crashed through the window now, um, on the radio. Which, by the way, it's very Terminator-like. They have wind oh blowing God, around yes. the street. It was clearly Terminator. Yeah, like, and, uh, um, w- it also caused the radio that was not plugged in, very obviously not mm-hmm. plugged in, start playing. And it, the, the newscaster said that, that they're experiencing what's being 
labeled as the devil's, the devil's win, win, which sounds like a really nasty ass fart. Yes. Like that's some shit that I'm probably going to be doing later. Today. In a, in a <laughs> van with curtains. <laughs> with, in a van with curtains. <laughs> <laughs> and those curtains just soak up that yeah, fart smell. Man. Also, there's actually a pretty cool shot leading into all of the Terminator-esque scenes with uh, the L.A. skyline and this huge red moon. Yeah, like that's a really cool. moon. It's pretty cool. Yeah. Um, it really definitely sets up the scene that maybe L.A. is now hexed, right? Yeah, oh, that's a good point. Because you know, like, yeah. there's a whole – there's a lot of, of things in the movie that you see things that just aren't right. And they say, oh, it's hexed. It's hexed. Not, the, yeah. the witch must be near, yeah. So yeah. that was kind of a cool little touch. Yeah, some of those things that they that they see later, I didn't quite get, but yeah. it, but certainly when they get to the farm, I understand yeah. what's going on. But um, so um, so the 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 roommate comes out. And he's like, "All right, well, let's help me get him to a bed." Okay, yeah. So a dude just <laughs> crashed in through. <laughs> That's so true. It's terrible. So a dude crashed through the window, which they say, "Oh, the wind." Yeah. Did they think that the wind carried him in through the window? The wind, yeah, the wind must be really bad because it blew, it blew a, a guy into their living room, and they really didn't even bat an eye. They were a little. No, they were nonplussed. Yeah. By the whole thing. I totally unagitated. I would have been way more agitated. I would have been pretty upset about yeah, what's going I on. I probably would have called the police immediately. Which she, they don't. She wanted to. She though. she kind of wanted to, but we'll talk about how kooky I think she <laughs> is here in a minute. She she definitely gave put up more of a fight, but not much of a fight. No, the he, guy's like the just, guy was kind of he's you know pretty compassionate. I mean, she even said something like that is, about his compassion. Yeah, you can't just take in any said, stray. Yeah. and he's like, "Oh, I took in you," which is the right. line that's used in every movie when you want to set up a kooky girl. Right. Yeah. She's so, some sort of a road twitch, exactly, as, as Stephen King would call a road twitch. It. Yeah. Yeah, uh, maximum overdrive yeah. coming someday. Coming to this... someday to this podcast. <laughs> um, <laughs> but anyway, um, so all right, so they're completely and totally like, okay, this dude's here now, and there's a reason why he's there, which we don't know at first. But uh, yeah. so the, the gay guy kind of runs like a an antique shop or has antiques of yeah. some sort. He's a collector. He's a collector of some sort. He's got like a bunch of old furniture. And uh, so, anyway, so they, they, they get Julian Sands, and they put him into a bed, and everything seems to be cool. Kooky girl. Let's just, let's just talk about, let's, let's talk about Cassandra with a K. Cassandra with a K. Uh, so, Cassandra is our, our main girl, and um, they set up that she's diabetic, which yeah. never really pays off. It except, does. It does. It pays off big time. Yeah, but not really story wise until the very end. She does mention it becomes that a device. It's a little bit of a MacGuffin. Yeah, sort of. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so like they 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 set up the fact that she's a your Sarah Connor type kind of put upon yeah. girl who's just trying to make her way. Um, she does she's have an ailment. She she's works a at waitress. a diner. Yeah, yeah. She works at a diner where the fry cook is like out in the open, mm-hmm. and she wears a sweater. A sweater Ugh. to work in LA at a diner. A sweater that is about three quarters length, so it always shows her belly, uh-huh. which that's great. That's well, nice. Steve Miner. That's so, yeah. totally Steve Miner. Oh yeah. We're we're convinced now after watching um, Friday the Thirteenth Part Two, which you'll hear our thoughts on that at a later date. Um, and this, mm-hmm. that, that Steve Miner has got a significant sweater fetish. Oh yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, so she, so she's got this sweater that's kind of bulky, but also like three quarters length, so it like shows off her midriff. She wears a crazy like sparkly mini skirt, black pantyhose and high heels or yeah, something, black so, tights. Yeah, black tights. It's just it's such a weird. She was aesthetic. wearing like, like like some Nike spandex tights or something oh that was when she was sleeping that was her pajamas that was her pajamas yeah so um so you know you kind of get the impression that she's kind of a modern girl she's kind of just trying to make it on her own she is she is an idiot yeah she's not smart um she i mean first she's kind of like whatever this dude's now who came through our window yeah is now living with us i guess um she puts him in her bed before she goes to work yeah, it's like help him out. And so while she's at work, surprise, surprise, uh, Julian Sands, I almost called him Julian Lennon. <laughs> <laughs> totally different Julian. Yes. Julian Sands wakes up, kills the gay guy by first. Well, he liked his ring. 
Yes. So, so this is a weird. We thought maybe this ring would would have some significance, but um, it's just it's just an astrological thing. Yeah, it's got a scorpion, and, and the the guy is a, is a Scorpio, and he's like, "Oh, you like my ring? I'm a Scorpio." Um, and Julian Sands just keeps clocking this ring. Eventually, he just grabs a butcher knife, grabs his hand, chops the finger off, takes the ring. The guy is is exasperated. He's shocked that, that his finger was cut off, and um. And then, yeah, it's a, and we think, oh, maybe this ring has got some powers that he knows about or something. No, no he never just again. It. He just wanted it, yeah. Now, what Which he, is a pretty good way of establishing, okay, definitely the bad guy, right? Like, he saved some cats. Save some cats, but cut off a guy's finger, pinky finger for his ring. No good. No, no good. bueno. So this is really the first time that we know definitively what kind of this guy's capable of and what his... Um, what he's willing just to do to people. Just to do to people just for his own selfish gain. Yeah. Because actually that does play out multiple times yeah. throughout the course of the movie. But so um But he's not finished with this guy yet. He's cut no, his finger off. He actually then goes in for what we think is just like a, a symbolic kiss of death or it's going to suck his soul out. Right, or, or, or something. Yeah, take his power or something. Or something. Yeah. Or life force or something. Right. But no, all he does is he just goes in and like Bites out the dude's whole tongue, yeah. and then what we don't see on screen is like a like a slaughter essentially because the cops come to the diner where Cassandra oh, but he, with Kate spits the tongue into the frying pan. Don't oh yeah, that out. yeah, because the guy yeah. was making yeah, breakfast. making breakfast. Yeah, he was making an elaborate. Breakfast. That's actually how I knew he was gay. <laughs> that I was like, oh, he's he's making. I was like, man, this guy's making like an elaborate dinner at ten a.m. It's like, oh, he's making an omelet. He's got everything lined out. He's, <laughs> He's either he's either really really into breakfast or he's a gay guy really into breakfast. <laughs> I would gay guy really into breakfast. Well, um, yeah, because because a straight dudes we eat eggs for dinner. Yeah. Because we don't get up early enough for breakfast. <laughs> I it, it, it's, I, it's probably a pretty poor stereotype on my part there, but but still, I kind of had to. That, that would have that would have been just kind of had I kind of had like a movie sort of. Um, signal that i'm supposed to believe this guy's gay and it because of, because he elaborately cooks right yeah uh, that's probably somewhere along the lines of the whole like um real men don't eat quiche or whatever that that yeah, book was or probably. whatever that was about masculinity but you don't actually know definitively until um yeah Lori or not Lori um cassandra with, cassandra with a k goes to the police station they tell her her roommate is dead she mentions that he was gay because I think they have some theory about him being gay. Well, they, they were well, not so much that they were that they had a theory. They were asking questions, which I think are actually legitimate questions. Of was he in any weird shit? Right. Was he into? Or did he just bring home strange guys? <laughs> because yeah. also keep in mind that this isn't too much. This is still well, the AIDS hysteria for sure. Well, hey, but also the whole thing about the the uh, the movie cruising the the, guy, oh, the yeah the the gay killer guy. Right, right. Which um, was in L.A. Right, or was that New York? That was New York, New York. probably. Yeah. Um, but I mean, that's still that's still. I mean, so she makes the point of saying he's not. He was gay, not queer. Right. Yeah. Which which um, I found interesting. Yeah, I mean, different different. Uh, uh, different uh, uh, terminology for that kind of, you know, what people would consider stranger lifestyles versus just being gay or straight. Right. Um, Which all in all, and I don't have a whole lot of, of ground to stand on in this area, but it felt like it felt like a gay character, albeit a very short-lived gay character in a low-budget horror film, was treated pretty well. Yeah, I, I mean, mean, not for, really for as that, a caricature. It was, no, I mean, it was he was actually really, really well. I thought, I mean, because that's why I thought the questions that were being asked by some of the most haggard policemen who seemed to be on a bender uh, were asked. Oh my god, they, they, they both looked like they had woken up at six a.m. at the bar and went to yeah. work. Yeah, and um, I mean, the guy who was asking the questions, I don't think he was asking the questions by saying, oh, he's some sort of deviant weirdo. I right. think he was legitimately asking the questions that a cop would ask, and she just was defensive. Yeah. And that's fine. Yeah. I mean, and I think that it was it was a well-done exchange, and if they wanted to, they could have pushed that show much further, but they didn't. Right, yeah. I mean, um, everything in this movie is right there on the surface. I mean, there's yeah. they don't dig a whole lot. And they don't, and they don't mean to. They, they don't even really um, uh, 
demonize or vilify the idea of witchcraft. No. Um, because as we find out later, when now... Um, demonize witchcraft. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. Um, no pun intended. Um, anyway, so when, uh, when Richard E. Grant, Redfern, shows up, he shows up in the same place as Julian Sands did, but appears later. Yeah. For whatever reason. Yeah, it's not really clear. And, um, you know, which is kind of interesting because I think there's a lot of stuff with Cassandra that we're told about her that we're not, that were never actually shown. Like, she's packing up all of her stuff and she's trying to get out of Dodge, not because she, she doesn't want any heat on her, but she's, she's a drifter. She's kind of a drifter. Yeah, and she's she, certainly flaky. She's got too real. And, yeah. And, and, of course, I mean, obviously she was living with this guy who probably has family and she she was just crashing there basically maybe paying a little bit of rent to this guy but she has no reason to be there anymore basically so she's she's gonna get out of dodge yeah and so she runs into richard e grant and he is um she's completely and totally again nonplussed that that there's she's a she's a little more appropriate appropriately reactive in this situation but she calls the cops. She calls the cops. No, she does call the she cops. She keeps her cool because she calls cops, and she tries to, like, not escalate what she could be a scary situation and wait for the cops to show up. Yeah. She actually does a – she's really smart there. I guess. I mean, I, I just kind of feel like it's, like, a lot of people are, are very oddly, like, all right, so there's a weird dude here now. <laughs> cool. You know, I mean, it's just, it's kind of weird. Yeah. But um, so he shows up, and he's, like, asking questions about where did the other guy go – in so many words. Did he bleed? Did he bleed? Because he wanted to get, he wanted to make a little bit of a witchy solution himself. Right. Which, what did, what did you okay. say? Okay. So I, I feel like, all right, it's very, you think about 17th century Salem and you think, all right, all witches were burned, right? I mean, they didn't have a whole lot of tolerance for anything that was even closely resembling witchcraft. So they've got this good guy now who shows up that can use this device with a witch's blood to track the witch like it will actually tell you which direction it was like a divining rod yeah yeah, yeah. and you know it's a compass and it and based on yeah, he called it a, a, a witch compass. yeah it's exactly what it is and it tells you which direction the witch is based on the blood that you put on the little spindle thing so is that not witchcraft or is that just like a functional device i mean is that not I mean, maybe any it's way... alchemy <laughs> Yeah, maybe. I, don't know. I mean, well, not out. So, but you know, so you there's know. all sorts of we talk. We we mentioned this a lot while watching this movie. It's like there's all sorts of little witchy things that this guy knows how to leverage throughout yeah. the course of the movie. It's like, how do you know how to do that? Like, what process of elimination did you take to where you know that that would work? And it all feels very rudimentary witchcraft. Like, yeah. if he just went to witch school finish witch school he would probably be julian sands level witch but a good guy though in Maybe. the service of the but of it's the but church, it, but it yeah seems, it, that's yeah. where it starts to be like all right whatever we've got you know good witch bad witch kind of yeah this is where you can kind of feel like maybe there was a little bit of retooling to the story because yeah. it's like the witch hunter is at a at a severe disadvantage if he doesn't use something yeah. that helps him track the witch um, and it's, it's very like, clear at this point too that we are in a reverse Terminator movie. Yeah, like we have good guy, bad guy, not from the future but from the past, who have to battle it out in a time that they are not familiar with, with a female hero at the male hero side. Yeah, yeah. So um, I also kind of drew some conclusions to like Highlander, where you mm -hmm. have like kind of old timey people in a present day. Uh, yeah yeah most definitely but but i think with highlander which is always what i loved about those movies or at least the first one <laughs> is that um is coming that, soon to the that, yeah that you have this long history the immortal the life of the immortal which i just think is really fun like you look at that with dracula you know no, the, yeah, sure. this character who's lived through through ages of Wars time and yeah and it's it was seen and, it all yeah yeah it's i always like that um so not 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 at all what we get here though with no. The fish out of water story, which we've yeah, talked about. Right. This was is very popular at this time. This is definitely well. a fish out of water type of thing. It's something that is definitely um, 
you know, I mean, but the thing is, is that the fishes that are out of water are not awkwardly trying to, I mean, there are lines that are said where it's like, oh, that's a weird thing, yeah. you know, but they don't really, they don't, you don't get any of that connection of them trying to figure out what life is. Right. Now. They just go right to it. It doesn't get do. quite as zany as like, um, Beastmaster 2 <laughs> or, um, or even, uh, Trancers gets a little zany with that. A little bit, but, uh, but yeah, I mean, in, I, I would dare say the transfers do it does it better. Yeah. Where it just it, it it puts the person into the past. Well, that's another future's past thing. So Yeah, it is. Um but anyway, um so the cops do come and they arrest uh Richard E. Grant, Redfern, um, which is kind of funny because he tries to use he, he carries a whip. He's very <laughs> much like Simon Belmont. Uh huh. And he tries to like whip the guns out of the cops' hands. He gets one of them. But a cop immediately, immediately tases, tases him. him. Yeah. Which is which is really <laughs> don't funny. Tase me, bro. Like, don't tase me, bro. But it's like, yeah, that would probably happen. You would get tased. Well, in LA, we thought. But then, but then we were like, all right, you got to think. This is this is a white man in in furs, like lots of furs, right? Who's getting immediately tased? I mean, I guarantee you, if that guy was black <laughs> and dead. looked and looked like the Candy Man in the oh, same he's, furs, right? Yeah. He's fucking dead. They kill dead him twice. So. They kill him twice. Yeah. Take him down, then kill him again. Yeah. Um, and then burn him over a basket of cats. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So. And then kill uh, him one more time. Yeah. Uh, now, th- the one really cool thing that I feel like is maybe the thing that a lot of people, you included, remember the most about the movie, happens next. Yeah. So while uh, while they're processing Redfern for <laughs> for being um, uh, for attacking a police officer with a whip. Um, Julian Sands shows up at a at a psychic medium, quote unquote psychic medium's place of business, and wants her to communicate with um. What was the name of the the demon? Oh name? God, Gamil or Zamil. 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 And so, and she's like, Oh yeah, sure, sure, I can do that. But she, but he realizes she's a fake, total fake, yeah. and so he she turns into a demon. Um, and like basically gives Julian Sands his mission, reassemble this dark Bible thing, yes. which they call the, um, the grim, the grimoire, the grim, the grim rar. Yeah. yeah. Um, the great grim rar or it's something. It's basically explained that every witch has her own book. And this is like the biggest, baddest witch's book. And included inside that is the true name of God. Yes, and if he is able to do that, and if he, if he knows the true name of God and allows for that knowledge to be known or used, it can undo reality. Right. Um, God made reality with His name; He it would, could be undone by somebody by, by knowing by his someone name. knowing His name. And so that would give the warlock uh, of the his rightful place as the one identified son of Satan. Yeah. Which apparently he is the son of Satan, but is it he? would, yeah. I mean, that, that's he's he's basically. The, he, I think they're kind of trying to build up some sort of an antichrist type of okay. uh, of scenario where he's basically, if you if you take on this task like a Herculean task and you win, Satan will will basically um, uh, grant you all of this glory and, right. and power and power and over you, uncreation. I guess. I mean, I, I guess know. it's not really clear. It's but not really clear, but it, it's it all, it's all of, evil man playing. They tried. Yeah, they tried. Yeah, it is. It's all. Yes. This is a bad thing that, <laughs> that the, the bad guy is going to try to do. That's bad. <laughs> but, um, but yeah, he does actually at one point though, in this seance session, ask this demon. It's like, well, why would I in, in more flowery old timey words, why would I want to undo creation? What's in it for me, the witch? What do I get out of the deal? You know, if I undo creation, I undo myself, essentially is what he's saying. So, yeah, he's being he's being promised all of these powers. My guess is some sort of a throne in hell. Right. Is sure. what my guess is. And it also, I think, assumes the fact, which is what the, um, the, the, the Puritans believed, which was witches were straight up the offspring of Satan. Satan, right. Um, so he ends up, uh, so he's told with my eyes, I will be able to guide you to these pieces of this book. 
So uh, the girl turns back to normal and he cuts out her eyes and carries them around and they and they kind of operate like like as if they're still in the head. They look around. It's like a compass. Yeah, like a, yeah. It's, it's, it's essentially He's got his, his own eyeball compass now. He's got an eyeball compass to find these books of this Grim Raw. And a much more effective compass than the good guy gets got because he's going to yes. set this fucking thing up every time to see which direction it's pointing in. And it's bulky. It's not mm-hmm. like he can hold it in his hand and just keep holding it. It's, it's belabored. Yes, it is. Because they're constantly, they're multiple I gotta set up my compass again. Yeah. Yeah. Which they eventually just set up a wire system inside the car. Yeah. I don't know if you noticed exactly. that or not. Yeah. Where basically he don't, he no longer has to just set it up every yeah. time they stop. Um, so, um, so this leads Julian Sands back to where he landed and where now, um, Cassandra with a K is alone again after the cops have arrested uh, Redfern and she's trying to get out of there and um, she confronts um, our warlock the warlock takes this really weird bracelet that uh, everything this girl wore throughout this whole movie <laughs> I was utterly fascinated with because it is it is what people would wear if they're trying to look like the late 80s early 90s yeah it, it's not it's it does forced. not seem real yeah but at the same time it was real and somebody put that the fucking shit on her and, and it's just so bonkers she had this charm bracelet that had little globes, globes. on it i remember those I remember oh those. i remember charm bracelets. i remember they're the ones with globes oh wow i yeah. don't i mean they were they gosh. were a thing they were actually a thing yeah i mean i don't doubt it i mean they make some pretty goofy charm Mini bracelets globes. Yeah, yeah i guess but so he takes it from her yeah. and basically says that Every day that passes, you will age two more decades. Two more decades. So she passes out, and when she wakes up, she's now 40 instead of 20. Yeah. And uh, re- uh, she goes to, she at this point realizes well, there's some witchy shit going Well, on. not only that, but I mean, it's it's we now realize that the reason why the little mini cyclone dropped him off at this oh, house yeah, yeah. was because the, um, the dude who lived there that he killed actually had some of the pages for this this witch book it was hidden in a table a that table. he had because right. he was an antique collector or had an antique store so our so our warlock finds the these pages with his with his psych, psych, psychic demon eyes yeah and um and that's when he cuts the spell so I, we're like oh interesting so maybe this demon knew what it was doing all along because that's why he knew to, to summon this demon um at, at the psychic's place because he somehow knew that this demon is what saved him from his execution and sent him yeah. into this new time. Into place. this, yeah, into yeah. this mission. Right. And I kind of feel like um, there's some stuff in this now that's become very convoluted. He left the place that had the pages just to come back to the place. That, yeah. I kind of feel like there could have been a, a rewrite in there well, that would have played well, yeah. that differently. I, I think my my first reaction was, like, oh, that's convenient. But then I was like, well, maybe that's why the cyclone dumped him there. Um, yeah, it's still kind of silly. Yeah. It's um, another, it's another, it's a way, it's a device to engage our, our, our female protagonist. Yeah. Um, so they, uh, so now she wakes up, she's 40. She realizes, um, oh geez, I, you know, I better go get the weird guy who put together that, uh, divination, divination stick. Yeah. That for, with the, right. with the blood. And, um, so <laughs> And she looks like a crazy old lady. Yeah. Like I'm 40 and I don't look as old as she looked as made up to be. Right. 40. She, she honestly looked like a 20 year old who had gotten cancer. <laughs> and yeah. And hadn't started I mean, losing her hair from chemo yet. Like right. that's kind of what she, she, looked she was. Like. She looked like a prematurely aged yeah. person. Incidentally, Lori Singer, I guess, was a nightmare on set during this movie. Um, she had just made Footloose and a couple other things, and I think she thought she was hot shit. And she gave the makeup artist fits over her makeup for the the forty year old version and sixty year old version of herself. Yeah. Yeah. Um, That's always I fun. Don't, yeah, I guess. I mean, uh, this is. A, I mean, as. Uh, I've got a lot of problems with Lori Singer well, in this movie. Well, by the time that she's 60, and we'll get there, I think that the filmmakers on this movie were trolling her hard because they did everything they could to make her look as fucking stupid as possible. As stupid as just basically just incapable of 
anything. Yeah. She she constantly almost gets in the car accident. She's um she says stupid things. Like she's almost riffing the movie herself. Yeah. But not. Like <laughs> she's she's the eyes of the of the audience. Like she's our gateway into this weird world of and she says so many goofy and bad. But we're and all un- way smarter than she is. Oh my god, yeah. she is we the get worst. what's going on for the most part. It's oh, she's just so bad, and uh, I mean, and, and and this isn't really anything necessarily against Lori Singer. I mean, she's not terrible in this movie. She just doesn't have doesn't have anything to work with much to work with. Yeah, and I I my theory is that halfway through, maybe not even halfway through making this movie, she realized she made a huge mistake. Yeah, because she starts to, I mean, you can start seeing that she's just, her heart's she's not into it. She's phoning it in. She's not really into it at all. No, and, um, I mean, lines have awkward timing. It could be bad editing, too, but mm-hmm. there's, there's, uh, there, there's, timing's bad. Um, it's just, it's. But at the same time, be a professional, you know. I guess. But maybe, maybe she just couldn't deliver the intent behind the the lines I mean, either. I, I don't know. I, I don't know. I mean, she's it's probably just dealing with a lot of bullshit. Yeah. Um, and speaking of bullshit, a big chunk of this movie is in fact bullshit. Yes. Um, because we we then they go on the road to track down uh, Julian Sands, and they have to stop every now and then so he can set up his little compass. <laughs> and oh my God, Redfern, just jeez. <laughs> um, so they they find out that um, well, a couple of things happen. They find a, um, a Julian Sands finds a little boy who he tells, you know, it's like, oh, I'm a witch. And the little boy's like, nah, you can't be a witch. You know, it's like, you gotta be, you gotta be a girl to be a witch. And he's like, oh, no, not, not exactly. And, and she's like, or, and the little boy was like, um, so don't you have a broomstick that you can fly around? Like in the like Wizard, Wizard of Oz. Yeah. And he's like, oh, I don't need a broomstick to fly. And he gives her this really creepy look, and yeah. it's actually a really cool scene. Because it's, the kid, it's, it's probably the best scene in the movie. Yeah, because he is really good at being both charming and scary at the same time. Julian Sands is actually excellent in this movie. Yeah, he really is. As much as he can be, um, he does a lot of subtle creepiness. <laughs> yeah, and um, the little boy is is interesting and funny, uh-huh. and he, he's pretty good at delivering his lines. Yep. And... Um, so, you know, so what we find out after a big commotion happens is that... Okay, so <laughs> he hands this off to me. Uh, so there's um, not far away, they hear um, uh, the Red Fern and um, Cassandra with a K. They hear some gunshots. They're talking to some locals and they say, oh, there was a, a coyote attacked a boy. They're killing. They're probably hunting the coyote. Um, so they're like, well, that's an odd thing so they go investigate and redfern tracks down the mom and said and asks her was your boy baptized and she kind of he yeah, actually does a really good job of of empathizing with her first it was actually a really well written scene too uh he he, yeah. he, he expresses a, a depth of, of grief for her and then asks her was your boy baptized she says no uh, my husband wouldn't allow it which is is set up in the scene which before the with scene the little before boy because the little boy says that his dad would never ever go to church and wouldn't want him to go to church so so julian sands knows our warlock knows that this boy is not religious probably not baptized which is important because it's then explained by redfern that um a uh a, <laughs> it's ridiculous but if you <laughs> boil the fat of a male child, an unbaptized male child, it creates a flying potion. <laughs> Wait, and a what kind of potion? A flying potion. You mean like, like, like Superman flying? Like Superman flying, and it is literally like Superman flying. He does the whole like arm thing. And yeah. Uh, so, so okay, so we could. We Are you could... baptized, Jeff? No, You're not a young boy, though. No. <laughs> <laughs> no, but I'm not. Um, so wait. So you're saying if we go find an unbaptized yes. boy and we boil his fat, yes, and obviously the bigger, chunkier boy, the more flying potion, the more flying potion, we could fly. We could fly, according to this movie. What are we doing there? I don't know. What are we doing? But we should be killing <laughs> unbaptized we, males. We should be. We should be looking into marketing this potion. Yes. No, you don't have to kill the boy. Just do. A little, yeah, do you can just strip a little off here and there. Yeah. Well, I mean, it, well, interestingly, I think that this this film this scene was actually supposed to be shot. 
um, but they opted not to shoot it. Um, and Julian Sands made a, like a, a very, uh, probably in one of the interviews on the disc, if we look for it, it's probably there. He makes kind of a, a, a wicked sense of humor comment about we spared the boy, both of them, right? Like the actor and the, the character, Yoinks. right? <laughs> but um, yeah, but um, but this is kind of, this has got some really creepy shit that comes after in the real world, this scene does, because... Yeah, let's get into that, because really, at this, this is the point, time to talk I mean, about it. Yeah, because I think that really, I mean, there's really not much to this movie. It's 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 Julian Sands, I mean, and we've talked a lot about what's in this movie, but it's, there, there, there are more interesting things surrounding this movie, surrounding the fact that, you know, that it, it was a big moneymaker, even though it didn't make back its budget. Yeah. Um, and we think that but that's, made money for Trimark. Made money for Trimark yeah. because Trimark didn't have to pay as much. Right. Um, and you know, so that's kind of interesting that that those types of things. And I think it probably did very well in, in on video. Oh yeah. And um, in and syndication, in, in syndication, yep. and things like that. And then there's there's interesting things about like the fact that you know uh, Lori Singer did not get along with the direction of her character and how she looked and how she, you know, I mean, and it, it shows through and she's a weird character to begin with. Those are interesting things in and of themselves. In addition to that, the movie fits into this weird, yes, there is a plot of you got to find these pieces of this book. And when the book gets pieced together, it can undo creation. And there's a big fight, and a, kind of a cool fight in a cemetery yeah. where they discover that tombs have been moved, which changes the desecration of the ability of Julian Saints to be able to get the final piece of the book. All of that is interesting. However, I think it's also interesting to point that this, or to point out that this is a movie made at a time when movies like this that were meant to be kind of cheap disposable or consume easily consumable horror entertainment really did not have much going on in it there, there's really not much going on in this movie no. there are scenes that happen there's i mean we can talk about scenes with with a mennonite that shows up which is bonkers and his the end of his story is absolutely bonkers it's, he loses his eyes and the, a, a little mobile of keys, of keys is given to is him, by, given our, to him. By, our, by Renfield, yeah, Redfern, Redfern. to <laughs> Redfern. Redfield, Renfield, Jesus, um, Redfern to, to to basically bring back his sight and to heal him. Right, that's bonkers. It's bonkers, and it's insane. But it's just a series of things that happen. What's most important is. So let's let's why don't you tell us a little right, bit so, about your research on so, this? So so yeah, this this movie actually weirdly has a place in history. Um not just a blip in, you know, stupid film history. Um so there was a copycat murder in Canada. It was a fourteen year old boy and an eleven year old boy, I believe, kidnapped an eight year old boy, killed him, stripped him of his flesh to burn it in the hopes of making a actual flight potion because they had because the 14 year old boy i believe was revealed had watched the movie warlock dozens of times wow i mean that yeah. this was a huge huge sensation in canada and it definitely trickled down into the states i don't remember it personally um but i do remember the v-chip and the v-chip was yeah was like a big a big controversy with censorship and and the artist you know, you could use this V-chip. Um, you could activate this V-chip on your like, cable um, device, and it would censor movies, almost like what that Christian organization was trying to do with movies. They would cut out all the bad parts and sell them as the clean versions, and the artists revolted. Yeah. Well, this was the same kind of deal before even that, I believe, where the V-chip was was basically cutting out the the objectionable material from from movies well, and from TV shows. Not just not just material but could prevent you from watching any channel that right. your parents deemed or anybody deemed to not be suitable right entertainment yes which is um cuckoo mm -hmm. um it's you know i mean but then again i mean we've talked about it. it's like i grew up in a in, i mean the fourth of four boys 
you know, I grew up in a pretty waxed environment. And, um, you know, my mom worked at nights, particularly when I was in high school. I was home alone at yeah. night. You know, I was in charge of my own bedtime. I was right. in charge of my own entertainment. And, I mean, she, it was just that, that whole idea of, you know, you just don't do what you see in movies. Yeah, you know, that's what's drilled into you. It's widely credited in Canada that this is the movie that tipped the the pro V chip contingent to 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 essentially allow the V chip to be a thing. The adoption, the adoption of the yeah. V chip. This was the movie that that tipped the scales, which I find fascinating. Like, yeah, I mean that that is something we we constantly hear scapegoats being made of entertainment, being be it movies, music, or video games in particular, um, and and obviously it comes from some place. Because obviously sometimes people do things that they see in movies in particular, or they adopt a certain lifestyle that they hear about in songs. Like, you know, I can understand, um, given the right scenarios, somebody could go from being agnostic or a Christian into becoming a, a Satanist by listening to the right music and, and adopting the right ideas or not having an outlet to blow off that steam and having it create a yeah. monster of some sort. Um, and there are cases like that. I mean, there are, there are movies that have led to copycat situations. I don't think there's been more movies to do that than there have been other cases of, you know, serial murder or rape or whatever. But it's uh, it is fascinating that this is a big touchstone in our recent history that um, that affected not just the country that it happened in, but also ours. Well, it is interesting. I mean, we can get super philosophical here, theological even in this kind of discussion. I mean, you can look at all of the the murder and rape and travesties that have been um that have been done in the name of even the bible right mm -hmm. um and, and think that yeah people look towards certain things as a guide for better or for worse and but but in most cases with something like a stupid movie like warlock you've got a broken individual like yes yeah. 14 year old kid who knows what his life was or 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 why his brain broke in the way it did but it wasn't. If it was, if it wasn't Warlock, it's gonna be something else, you know. I mean, oh, something yeah. else was gonna break this kid. He was, he was probably without any sort of intervention going to do something terrible. Yeah, whether it was Warlock or Wolfenstein right. or or name anything or yeah. name anything, name you know, freaking fried green eggs and ham. I mean, who knows? Sure, right? You just don't know. And it, it's, so yeah, I mean, and the fact that this kind of movie came out even after sort of the hype hysteria mm -hmm. around satanism and, and i mean i remember this is kind of a very much of an aside but i remember the ninth hole at this little golf course in charleston west virginia there was this little bank, there was a bankment of a hill and there's woods up above and i remember all the kids used to say that there was a campfire up there where they, where they sacrificed humans like oh, devil we, worshipers we, would go we, and sacrifice we, had those, we all had, we had that right stories, we all yeah. had that place in the woods where the humans were sacrificed or, or they were sacrificed cats or whatever to the, to the devil, right? That's yeah. where the devil was. Uh, yeah, we had a, a series of trees in my neighborhood where um, it, they had marks on it that somebody had carved in, like, numbers. And uh, somebody would always say, it's like, yeah, but there was a guy, and he, he killed his family, and he put him in the trees because he was a druid. And it's like, no. <laughs> what? <laughs> Which is it's terrifying right. if you get the right scenario and the right breeze that blows through that. Yeah. It was terrifying because it was in a relatively in close spot. In fact, we could drive by there sometime because that still exists. I've actually seen it oh, in the wow. last yeah, few Yeah, we used to play flashlight, uh, yeah. like um, spotlight tag, you know, mm -hmm. on this golf course. And yeah, we, we'd never go up there. Like, yeah. Kids would be terrified to go up there. Yeah, and I mean, so we all have those things that are part of our collective conscious, our, our you know, and, and part of our growing up that that we, we hear and we think of those bad stories and we hear the, the crazy things that... Oh, it, you know, Leatherface was a real person, uh, sort of. He was a sort of a real person. Right. Um, and, you know, oh, um, you know, you can make yourself see and believe whatever you want. And obviously, if you have trouble spots in your life, 
those things can twist a different way. I mean, look at Slender Man, you know? Oh, yeah, yeah. I mean, a recent yeah. example. Yeah. Absolutely. You got, you got, you got some, you know, you got, <laughs> you, you got spooky linguine uh-huh. and, uh, spooky spaghetti, and spooky spaghetti, <laughs> creepy <laughs> pasta. Creepy pasta. And, uh, <laughs> and so, yeah, I mean, there's, uh, but yeah, if, if, if you're not quite wired the right way to have an imagination that can deal with that, or you have a traumatic thing that happens in your life, suddenly you start to think you've broken with reality. Right. And you start to see, you start to look at things like warlock or, um, Oh, uh, even, even, uh, witchboard or, you know, you start seeing, you, you start believing the opposite of what the moral of the stories are trying to teach you yeah. that, um, you know, like, cause this movie, it's makes- good versus evil. Exactly. They make no bones about no. that that the warlock is bad, right? You know, and that he is doing bad things. Yep. I mean, he. I mean, he he puts the the hex on the girl in this movie and makes her old and ultimately dumb, um, because he's he's a he's a dick. You know, yeah. he just does it to just throw her off. And, and her... he's he's not even per- portrayed as a character who's overly cool either. He doesn't like get. He's got power, sure. That's great. But he's not char- charismatic. No, really. he's not charismatic. I mean, except for the little kid. But he sh- he was like purposely trying to lure a little, right. like a witch. Woman. He was he was being a predator. Which yeah. a, which would fit the witch role, right? I mean, at oh, that point, he's, definitely. It's classic a Cancel and Gretel, or the Blair Witch even. Yeah. I mean, I mean, it's it's the. I mean, it's every witch story. At some point in time, the reason why the witch ultimately becomes evil or is seen as evil is because of alluring, mm-hmm. predatory. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, I mean, it's I that is fascinating. I mean, um, so it's fascinating because of the thing that happened. Yeah, I assume that the kid's still in jail, or went I don't to jail. know. Actually, I, mean, I didn't, my research didn't take me that far. Um, I think so. I can't imagine that. I, he's, well, you know what? I don't even I mean, know. I don't even know that they were tr- tried as an adult. I, I believe, if I read correctly, they might be. He might be free. It could be a situation I've seen. Or in a mental hospital, I think maybe is what I have seen stories like that, where like a young person does something like totally heinous, for whatever reason, did not get charged as a as an adult, be it mental capacity or just the sheer. I think age. it might have been a mental capacity thing. And <laughs> the person ultimately served their time. Um, and when I mean now, just live a whole new life under a different name. Nothing, nothing, nothing bad's happened since. It was just a, a traumatic moment. That's and a big one. That's a big one. It's a big one. Yeah, it, but it happens. I mean, whew. well, anyway. Yeah. So that's so, the thing that happens, and, yeah. and it's like an interesting thing. I mean, it's probably the most interesting thing about this movie if you were to rank it in the history of. Of things that happen, right? I mean, more like the movie is a blip, but that actually is a pretty significant historical marker. It it is far more. Uh, it it is everything that those special interest groups warned against yeah. that they were trying to attack things like Nightmare on Elm Street, Friday the Thirteenth. Um, yeah, it gave well, it gave them ammunition. Is what it right? Did. But yeah. what's funny is it was it was a small one off. Sure kind of situation where it was like oh no it's not the popular i mean it's not that kid didn't put on a hockey mask and, right and kill right of sure campers i mean he was doing something very specific that was that that had in some way shape or form a belief behind it that he was doing something satanic right or doing something that was witchy or whatever you know and not just because he watched the movie or he was exposed to it. I don't think that was why he did. I mean, what he did exactly is because of the movie, but what he did didn't happen because he watched that mm-hmm. movie. Uh, he was going to kill something or somebody. anyway. Um, no. So, all right. So let's, let's just kind of get to the end of the movie. Sure. here. So, um, so they do get to Boston. So they travel from LA to Boston, which is actually really funny. Right. It is a funny scene because they have to go through an airport. He has used a, um, at a the farm, weather vane. a weather vane to, to stab, uh, Julian. Not Sands. just stab, but he throws it. He throws him. it. He javelins it. He gets it. it. gets it right in his back. Yeah. He and so it. basically he is starting to carry this weapon around because 
he's, he's convinced it's well he's effective with it. yeah um yeah. which is really weird and awkward it's really weird yeah so he's uh he's carried this from the farm where the mennonite was with just this random mennonite living with his kids mm-hmm. who are not mennonites no that's weird um <laughs> God, we could but talk. the Mennonin was on a level. He knew what was going on. Oh, he like, knew immediately. He, he, he did not take any time to get up to speed. No, he's like, we're bewitched. Yeah. We got problem. <laughs> we got problems. We got problem. I'm, I'm down. Let's get this Let's, done. Yeah, and he's like, <laughs> he is like in the fight with the yeah. guy until he gets his eyes taken from him, essentially. So, um, it, it, I mean, we could talk for three hours about why there's a fucking Mennonite in this movie <laughs> living with regular English kids right. you know or whatever um so it's that's so weird but um so he is so redfern has taken the weather vane onto this plane which was one of those double decker planes yeah. kind of kind of fascinating to see those because i've never ridden on one i've never you know very I, pre 911 obviously there are, oh, people, there are people like smoking and you can carry a weather vane on there yeah with a huge spike yeah and so they uh he sees something on the plane that he believes Oh, this this flight is bewitched, and he's already weirded out about the idea of flying, but now he is, you know, even more so bothered by it because he sees something that tips him off to think there's a witch on board. Yeah, because earlier at the farmhouse, like shit wasn't going right, like the bread wouldn't rise and stuff. So that was one of the the clues that the the farm was bewitched. Or and hexed, he can, I mean. and, and because he's a witch hunter, he either sees the signs or knows when bewitch when there's some sort of something is bewitching yeah where he's so at. this guy's creamer on the on the flight was curdled and there was something up with the the lighter and the guy lighting the cigarette it was blue flame was a blue flame or something yeah. yeah so he's like oh there's the the, the the flight is hex there's a witch close so they start to split up they look all over the the plane eventually it's just kind of decided that he's being paranoid they go back and they sit down, and then you see Julian Sands in the bottom of the plane, um, eating more, drinking more of his of his uh, little boy fat. Yeah, and which is his, his which flight is, potion, which is fan fucking fantastic because you got a couple of guys who are like going to unload the the cargo the the cargo hold the 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 suitcases and everything from the bottom of the plane, which is where Julian Sands is hiding, and uh, when they open that up. Julian Sands just flies right out of it, and they look at each other like, "Well, you don't see that every day." You know, it's like yeah. they're they're like a couple of stoner kids essentially, <laughs> and they're like, "Oh, okay, whatever." Okay, that was a yeah, it, it, nothing more is said. He's just he, but uh, so this is also now we're in the third act here. Yeah, and this is when we're actually told what the warlock is doing. Yeah, which is problematic to do this so late in the movie. So uh, this is well, where we've kind of had an idea, haven't we? Like, well, we know that he's getting these relics, but we don't know. It's supposed to we bring, don't know bring what about the, the undoing of creation. We know that. Well, but we don't know why. We don't know okay. like we don't know exactly what this book is, and I mean, it's explained to us in plain speech by a priest um, or a, 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 a minister of some sort, an Anglican. He's, yeah, he's a vicar. A vicar, yeah, yeah, an Anglican vicar. So he's told, he's telling our our heroes that it's like, okay, he's he's building this book. When the book gets put together, because the book can heal itself too, so you can't just simply destroy yeah, the destroy book. It. The book can heal itself. So what you need to do is you need to keep him from assembling this book, which will reveal the real name of God. Yeah, and he can use that to undo creation. Right, and which is both intelligent and also bonkers yeah. it's, it's a crazy it's, it's a, a crazy perfectly specific, serviceable but it's very specific premise. it's a very specific like knowing the name i mean i don't know i mean like we said we don't know if that's maybe something that's, in yeah. hebrew no idea if that's a thing at all like, yeah. I, I think the the you know, yahweh is supposed to be the the name of god in the hebrew text which that's what I thought, is one of the oldest text i mean maybe there's something in sanskrit i don't know i don't know but, but uh, <laughs> so he's so that's why the warlock's been going around doing all this stuff because he's assembling essentially the dark Bible. And, uh, so this leads to a big fight in the, uh, in the cemetery, in the cemetery, which is cool. It's like an old new England cemetery. Yeah. So it's just kind of like a a crappy little cemetery, which is just, you know, in this little section of town with a backdrop of Boston. (laughs) Yeah. That's pretty clear. Clearly in a set. Yeah. Uh, it's it did look terrible, 
but it's it was it was obvious. Maybe it's just Blu-ray. I don't know if yeah, we watched this on shitty VHS. It wouldn't have been, you know. I don't know. But half of this cemetery is um, it's got like almost this poltergeist thing to it. Half of this cemetery is on consecrated ground, and half of the cemetery is not because they've been moving the bodies to make way for these new condominiums that are that are going to be built. Which is one. A very cool thing that happens. Like, that's an interesting twist that happens in the movie. It's like, oh, they're doing... Like, there's a reason why this plan may fail. Yeah. Because Julian Sands can't enter consecrated ground. Um, and when they find the, the, the tomb that has the last piece of the book, we come to find out it is... Uh, Red Fern's Red tomb. Red Fern's tomb, yep. Which flips boom, him boom, out. Boom. Yeah, and he's like flipped out that it's like, oh my god, I'm dead. Which, like, Lori has boom. one of her best lines, I'm um, sorry, uh, yeah. Sandra the Cat has one of her best lines in the movie. It's like, what, you think you were going to live forever? Right. Yeah. Which is, I mean, for a lot of what she, she's, uh, yeah, there's there's some creepy pasta that we can talk about, like with, you know, like things that get passed down through because of our, our knowledge of, of horror movies. Almost all of her lines, though, are like word pasta. It's yeah, just like yeah. throwing stuff out there and just saying stuff, and it's so annoying. <laughs> but um, so she, uh, but yeah, that was a good line. And uh, so we find out that the one, they're moving the bodies on the other side of the consecrated. There's a wall yeah, there's that a wall. literally shows the line of what's consecrated and what's not. And they're moving the bodies on the other side of the wall. And uh, but. I would buy one of those condos because it's consecrated ground. Yeah, no doubt. <laughs> yeah, they're not going to be have to worry about vampires. You don't have to worry about warlocks or witches, devil worshiping fools. Probably not even werewolves. Werewolves, maybe. Yeah, I don't know how they're in Satan or not. Uh, yeah, I just yeah, yeah, I don't know. Yeah, it's pretty pretty good. Pretty but good spot. Uh, yeah, so that's that's pretty that's pretty decent. But uh, so finally, after about an hour and a half, we finally get around to bringing back up the fact that uh, Cassandra with a K is diabetic. Yes. So um, earlier in the movie, we saw uh, Richard E. Grant like salting a whip uh-huh. to, because uh, salt, salt is bad. Wrenches. It's basically bad for anything demonic as, as I've ever heard it or known. And so he's basically going to use that to basically continually hurt uh, the, the warlock. And so she realizes that there's this little salt water pond near the... Well, she, why did she realize it, Jeff? Because... <laughs> she, she, so... <laughs> yeah. So um, she gets uh, taken captive, or basically held as a human shield, <laughs> for you know basically saying, if you don't give me the rest of the book, Redfern, I'm going to kill... I've already killed your wife back in the 1600s. I'm going to kill this new friend of yours. And uh, he's like, all right, fine. He sets down the book on the ground. And he's like, without magic or whatever, come and take the book, yeah. which is kind of a cool thing where it's like, you can have it if you can take it. A mano, a mano. Right. And so yeah. like, they, they start like a, like a fist fight. What did he say? What did he say? So, so the whole time, the, our red fern is talking like a um, oh, like Yoda. like a like a Boston Yoda, right? So Jeff Jeff says, uh, "Magic not fist just." Yeah, because <laughs> he says no magic, just fist. You said no magic, just fist. And Jeff said no, 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 magic no, 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 not no. fists just. <laughs> yes, yeah, I could rewrite this movie in a heartbeat. So, <laughs> so. Um, they they duke it out, and it's actually pretty. I mean, it's it's a it's your real first like fist on fist, good guy versus bad guy. Yeah. I mean, it's it's they previously their fights have just been kind of off distance fighting. Yeah. Um. So, um. Of course, Julian Sands cheats. Well, I, I don't know. here's the thing. I don't see it that way. So what happens is Redfern um tackles. Julian Sands and puts his head on the ground across the uh, wall, which is in the oh, consecrated ground. Man. So it starts to burn his his face on the consecrated ground. And at that point, Julian Sands uses magic to put, put like fire in Redfern's throat. Yeah and, yeah. and he actually then makes a comment afterwards. It's like, I feel like now the rules have changed. So I feel like 
It was a trick. It, I feel like, honestly, that he felt like, oh, well, now magic is using, being used against me in the form of consecrated ground. I can use magic back. Hmm. I didn't necessarily feel like it was a breach of contract. Well, <laughs> you might be you you might be blinded by the fact that he saved cats by escaping. He did save cats. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so anyway, I mean, so basically, things are not looking so good. Uh, Lori tries to jump in to strangle with the salted whip. Yes, uh, Julian Sands, which tragically bad. Like, oh, it was, not, it not was even close. War, not even close. It was a bad attempt. It was a it was bad, really attempt. really terrible, actually. Yeah, real, real, real bad. It didn't even hurt him at all. She, she's a mess. <laughs> um, the, so, <laughs> so he flings her into the pool of water. Flings her. Flings her big time. Because he just picks her up and throws her. Yeah. <laughs> Which is hilarious. It's like she's a little boy unbaptized baptized fat because she flies. She, she flies. So she lands in the water and she realizes from the water on her lips, it's like, Oh, this is salted. Yeah. So she she pulls out some, uh, some syringes, syringes, yeah, and <laughs> which fills is, it with salt water. Fills it with salt water, yeah. and just before, uh, I mean, Julian Sands like assembles the book and is about to undo all of reality, and she sticks the 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 needles into his neck, and his neck starts bulging. It gets all veiny and everything. Yeah, it was kind of a cool effect. Yeah, it kind of felt like it was just gonna. Slow down, you know? Yeah. But holy shit, it took him down. It melted him. It melted him, like, fast. <laughs> Very quickly. Yeah. Like, faster than he could melt down the, the little boy fat. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. In fact, it, it was so fast, there wasn't even any fat left. It was gone. Like, it, yeah. He, and then it was he, disintegrated. His eyes do come back. Yeah. Because Redfern walks up to him, and it sounds like he may be about to say God's name, which I determine God's <laughs> name was just simply Mike. Mike. Uh, because of course it would be. So it's about he's about to go Mike. <laughs> but right at the last moment, Redford what is crushes, it? His, crushes face. his face. Yeah. yeah. And uh, that's that. So um, <laughs> Redfern then like, you know, says he loves Cassandra because of course that's what happens in these dumb movies. We're gonna see this a lot. Yeah, oh yeah. Um, and he like, you think, oh, they're going to live together forever because how's he going to get back home? He gets taken back home. Like, he just disappears. Yeah, he gets cycloned away. And, uh, or actually, we don't even see it. Do we see a cyclone? Yes, because oh, it leaves yeah. behind a message on his tomb yeah. for her. He says some last words to her, and then those last words are then left on his tombstone. And then, and then she's like, oh. Like, literally. Yeah. I think she's like, she's, she's kind of oh. like, oh, that's cute. And then she turns. Yeah, and she looks And the she book. sees the witch book, which is <laughs> could literally be the destruction of the universe if in the wrong hands. And she goes, oh. Yeah. <laughs> it's now it's actually just, a really perfect moment. Yeah. And so she realizes, oh, shit, I got to watch after this book. Yeah. And so she buries it in the salt mines. Yeah, the um, salt flats. The salt flats. And, uh. Yeah. That's the, uh, that's the end. That's the end of the movie. And so <laughs> the movie's not good. It's not great. Um, um, talking about it, I think. There are interesting things in interesting, this movie. They're interesting, yeah. It's, um, she is bad. Like, Cassandra is a bad character. It's a bad character. It's a very bad character where we are told that she is spunky and, yeah. and kind of uh, happy-go-lucky. We're not shown why, other than she's some sort of analog for every other character you saw in the 80s and yeah. these types of movies. Um, I did like Richard E. Grant and, and they're Julian both, Sands. They're both really good. Uh, because Richard E. Grant does have a lot of empathy where they are perfect opposites. Mm -hmm. um, Julian Sands is creepy and, and predatory at times and has no, 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 no uh, problem whatsoever just fucking over people right. left and right right he's yeah. he's very selfish like he's he is only in it for himself at all costs like yeah he has no compassion no empathy i mean he is like the terminator right i mean he he is very much you know that kind of stoic evil yeah and i mean for a movie that that it probably cost too much for its time frame in which it came out and what's in the movie I feel like if you had told me that the movie was made for half the amount or a third of the amount, I would say uh, then the effort was good. There were some good things in there. Um, love the little eyeball things. Yeah. I love the the fight at the end of the you know in in the in the very 
uh, atmospheric um, cemetery. Cemetery, yeah. Only, yeah. And um, there were there were little flashes of brilliance mm-hmm. throughout this movie, but it really does feel like though that it, there was probably a lot of things that had to be excised from the story or from the movie at the end. That, that causes it to kind of misfire in certain places. Yeah, it's an interesting thing. I mean, I think that it was a serviceable script. I do agree with Cassandra with a K. It was poorly written. Um, David Twoey was the, the screenwriter, and he's written a lot of just kind of schlocky sci-fi, if we're being honest. He's the... He's but a the, couple of really good things. He's the guy behind the um, the, the um, Chronicles of Riddick movies, so like Pitch Black, um, Chronicles of Riddick, and... Uh, Last one, Riddick, was that the name of it? I think so. And I think he's still trying to get Furia off the ground, the fourth one. Um, Pitchfork, put the Pitchfork, geez, Pitch Black is a pretty good movie. Yeah. Um, and actually a pretty well-written female protagonist in that yes. movie. Um, so, I mean, maybe so it's... So it, it's, it's an early effort from him. Um, maybe it was just the job. I mean, yeah, I don't know. I mean, I, I generally like him. I, I was telling Jeff before we watched the movie that I was that David Twoey has done two of my favorite genre films of all time. He um, he's, was the writer and director of Grand Tour, Disasters in Time, which I hope we can get to at some point on this podcast because it's phenomenal. And then uh, Critters 2, he wrote. <laughs> um, and we're definitely getting the Critters. We're definitely getting the Critters. That is on the list. Yeah. Um, Critters 2 is the last good Critters movie. Critters 3 and 4 are rough. But, um, but uh, yeah. But that, that's what we do. I mean, yes. Yeah, so. so we're going to watch them. Um <laughs> But yeah, I mean, I think, you know, uh, yeah, I didn't like it either. <laughs> well, here's the thing, though, because I, I mean, if we were to see the movie ourselves, by ourselves, nobody, you know, like you weren't around and I saw it on TV or I wasn't around and you saw it on TV, we probably would care about the movie. We would, we would, would nostalgia would probably win over. Um, I wanted to ask you, if you had to to rate this movie on a five star basis, <clears throat> what would you give the oh, movie? Oh man, um, well I got two ratings. Actually, this is this is a perfect moment. Um, so I'd probably give it like two, two and a half maybe. I mean, it's watchable. This mm-hmm. is a watchable. It's movie. totally watchable. I mean, two and a half is probably the best I could do because it is watchable. It's not incompetent in any way, shape, or form. It's um. It's got some good production value behind it. It um, it has, I think, enough of that sort of late '80s, '90s pastiche mm-hmm. to get you through, and you can kind of understand its place in, in kind of the, the genre movement of that time. Uh, Julian Sands and um, I always forget the other Richard guy, e. Grant. Richard E. Grant, both put in really, really good performances. It's 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 serviceable. Um, so probably two and a half stars. The other rating I want to attribute to this, and I'm not quite sure what I want to give it, but I want to describe this because it's kind of stupid. Um, but I think it's – I've always found this little piece of music trivia interesting, that there have been um, three bands in the history of bands that have named themselves the Warlocks. Hmm. Now, one of them exists today. Um, I don't know them very well. They're a band out of L.A. Um, I think they kind of do like, uh, like uh, garage rock, psych rock. Kind of stuff, but I've never actually heard them. The other two bands were The Grateful Dead and The Velvet Underground. Hmm. Yeah, both formerly known as The Warlocks. So I was thinking, wouldn't it be fun to attribute a band to each one of the three Warlock movies? Hmm. And I was, I was sure, I was like positive going into Warlock One that it was going to get The Velvet Underground because Velvet Underground are awesome. And I was like, yeah, I'm going to really like Warlock One. It's going to be great. But I don't know, man. I feel like because of the L.A. Um, setting and the fact that it, it came in a little under expectation, um, I'm going to give it the unknown L.A.-based hmm. warlocks that are currently in existence today. I'm going to save Velvet Underground and The Grateful Dead for two and three. That's a oof. bold choice, I know. That is a bold That's choice. That's a bold choice, but I'm going to uh, do it. I'm going to do it. I'm, I'm, I'm going to... I'm, I'm going to give it the L.A.-based contemporary current Warlocks. <laughs> they, they get Warlock 1. They'll probably be so happy about that. Um, so, all right. Well, first of all, I was going to give the movie – I'm actually going to give it a three-star rating. Oh, wow. Uh, I'm going to give it a little over Midland um, just because 
the movie is actually pretty well made. Yeah. Um, it is not short on the production. Um, I mean, there there are some things that it's like, ooh, that could have been done a little bit better. But given it's uh, the fact that it was made by New World, which was not exactly going to have a whole lot of spare money, um, given the fact that it was not um, that it was not starring big time people, even though Steve Miner made the movie, who had been doing movies for some time, yeah. Um, and cool movies and cool movies too movies that people knew um i i'm gonna give it three because it it does there is a um i mean aside from the performances of our two leads um uh the the heavy in in our you know our our heel and face if you will um that is uh, that's um that yeah i mean i can see myself having a really kind of reserving a special place in my in, in my own kind of heart and mind for if this movie came on tv i'd be more than happy to watch it if i i mean especially if, assuming i didn't have anything more pressing you know like i i can watch a movie i have a choice between warlock and i don't know i <laughs> Pick something that would be shit. Warlock two. Warlock. <laughs> probably have a choice between Warlock or Batman v Superman. I'll probably watch Warlock. Um, so that's. I mean, I'll give it a three star just because it is incredibly watchable and charming in its own way. Mm-hmm. As far as the bands, this is really so much more of a you thing than it yeah, is it me. is. Yeah. Um, but I'm gonna go ahead and give it the uh, the, the Grateful Dead because right. uh, be, because there is a the Grateful Dead, regardless of what people th- and even to a certain extent what I think of them, there is a, a pedigree there, and there was a pedigree for this oh, first okay. movie. All right. Um, so yeah, I'll give it. I'll give it the, the uh, Grateful Dead. The Grateful Dead. Cool. Yeah, well, I'm really excited to see. I have it. a feeling we've gone opposite directions. No, I think here. I think that's cool though. Yeah. So, all right. but anyway, so uh, I think that's going to pretty much wrap up our episode here. Um, yeah, we talked about Warlock way more than I thought we would. I, I've got a feeling we're making up for these sequels because I've got a yeah, feeling these yeah. sequels are going to be they're going to be rough, um, um, and we're going to do Warlock two immediately after closing here. So. Yeah, so uh, in in two weeks you'll be able to hear that. Um, so uh, that's really kind of the plan here. We'll we'll be you know sitting down with a with a set slate of movies, three or four that we'll watch, then we'll talk about them, we'll release those on a biweekly schedule, but. Uh, so yeah, I mean, we are, uh, we're getting ready to uh, dive right into our sequels. And, uh, so, um, you know, I mean, the, the, yeah, so I think we're pretty much, uh, I think we've gone as far as we possibly can with Warlock with 1. Warlock 1 yeah. yeah. And, uh, and there was still, still some stuff we could talk we, about. We but... definitely burned a dead cat with, or yes. burned a live cat, I should say, with, with Warlock 1. And beat a dead horse. And beat a dead horse. Yeah. So, uh, so this is uh, Jeff Arbuckle. This is Jason Oliver. And uh, you know, like us on Facebook and all that good stuff. Uh, follow yeah, us the on Facebooks, the Twitters, the Twitters, and, uh, the in- and Instagrams, and uh, yeah, and uh, we hope to see you uh, come back in a couple of weeks for a discussion of Warlock Two, Armageddon, Armageddon, Armageddon. Oh, I guess we uh, Armageddon out of here on this one. So, <laughs> on that note. All right, have a good one, and uh, check us out in a couple of weeks. Who appointed you executioner? He did save cats! <laughs>